Well, we're joined here today by Father Vincent Lampert. How are you today? I'm very well, Seth. Thanks for uh, having me on today. No, we're really excited to actually have a, a real-life exorcist on <laughs> on the podcast. So, you know, just to start off, let me go ahead and ask why you became an exorcist. How did that come about? Was this something you chose, or was it something that was chosen for you? It was something that was chosen for me. So I was ordained a Catholic priest back on June the 1st of 1991, so I'm in my 31st year and 14 years into priesthood. So back in 2005, my bishop in the uh, city of Indianapolis uh, appointed me to do this. So when a priest is ordained, he promises obedience to his bishop and his successors. So the, the bishop of Indianapolis told me that he wanted me to do this ministry. Indianapolis has always had a priest assigned to this task, even when it fell out of practice. You know, during the 1960s, very turbulent times, the church had the Second Vatican Council, and many dioceses discontinued the ministry of exorcism. A lot of people even thought that perhaps evil was not really personified in what we call the devil and his evil spirits, the fallen angels. A lot of times people might say that Evil is nothing more than humanity's inhumane treatment of one another. So my bishop said, I'm not really sure what I'm asking you to do, but because we've always had a priest in this role, I want you to be that priest and go and figure it out. <laughs> how, how was figuring it out? Uh, do, you, do you have any stories from some of your first cases, uh, your, some of your first positive cases? So, yeah, starting. absolutely. When I was appointed, I became one of only 12 Catholic priests appointed to this ministry in the United States. The church says the best way to train to be an exorcist is through the apprenticeship model. But obviously, there really weren't enough priests in the United States that I could turn to, that I could mentor under. So I traveled to Rome in the early part of 2006, and I was able to, uh, to live in Rome for three months. I found a Franciscan priest who was an exorcist who permitted me to um, observe 40 exorcisms that he performed over the time that I was there. And then I was able to learn firsthand the church's ministry to those who were up against the forces of evil and who were seeking the help of the church. You talk about examples, you know, I still remember the first exorcism that I sat in on. I was uh, talking with this elderly woman and her husband we're in a small little office room, and she's explaining to me why she's possessed. And I'm thinking, well, she doesn't look like or act like she's possessed. She seems very normal. And during the whole time of the conversation, the priest who was training me, his name was Father Carmine. Father Carmine would go in and out of the room. He came in one time, and he placed a roll of paper towels on the table, and then he walked back out, and he came back in again and tied a plastic grocery bag onto the wall radiator. He walked back out again, and then he came back in again, and he started to pray the prayer of exorcism. And as soon as he did that, the demon manifested. This little elderly woman who had been very kind and pleasant that I was speaking with, immediately it was no longer her. A demon had taken over. Her eyes rolled in the back of her head. She began to growl and snarl. She was foaming at the mouth, throwing out blasphemies against God and cussing out the priest, Father Carmine. He was unfazed. He reached over and tore a paper towel off the roll that he had brought into the room. He wiped the lady's mouth off and threw it in the, the plastic bag on the wall radiator and just continued to pray. Of course, the whole time I'm thinking to myself, what in the world has my bishop gotten me into? But it turned out to be a very good uh, training experience being there in Rome. And again, then coming back to the States, I've been doing this ministry now for the past 17 years. Wow, that's quite a story. Now, are you and the bishop, are they a pretty exclusive group or are there quite a few exorcists within the Catholic Church? The numbers have grown. The Catholic Church would say that every bishop is the exorcist by virtue of his ordination. It's based on uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter nine, verse one, where Jesus sends the 12 out and he gives them authority over all unclean spirits. So it's the recognition that bishops, by virtue of their office, 
and the Catholic notion is that the bishops today are the successors to the apostles, so then they would have that ability or that command, the gift given to them by Christ in order to expel demons, and then bishops at their discretion can appoint one or more of their priests to exercise, if you will, this ministry in their name. So you mentioned right before we came on that in the month of October, you're quite busy because there's <laughs> apparently a large need for exorcists around the time of October. So I guess that leads to a two-part question for me. Number one, why October? And number two, has the Ministry of Exorcism, you pointed out there was a trend away, but has it been growing in recent years? Yeah, I think October with Halloween coming up at the end of the month, and right now there's a lot of people that get fascinated by the reality of evil and everything associated with Halloween. Even one of the entry points for the demonic into people's lives can be the entertainment industry. And you look at our country today, Halloween has become the second biggest spending holiday right after Christmas itself. You know, people are decorating their yards with all kinds of things associated with Halloween. And many of these things glorify evil, in my opinion, and even draw attention to the demonic. And because there's so much of that right now in the public realm, there's a lot of people then who start wondering whether or not they've done something that may have opened up an entry point to the demonic in their lives. Now, just because somebody thinks they're dealing with the demonic, that's not necessarily the case. They may believe that, but again, the role of the exorcist is to investigate cases of alleged demonic activity and then to make the determination whether or not it's truly something of a demonic nature. And then if it is, then to uh, perform the rite of exorcism that the church has laid out. Yeah, I, I mentioned earlier that I was one of 12 back in 2005, Catholic priests in the United States who was appointed to this ministry. Today, that number is 150. So there are 150 Catholic priests in the United States who are now trained to be exorcists. And it isn't necessarily that there's more demonic activity in the world today, per se. I always like to say it isn't that the devil has upped his game, but perhaps more people today are willing to play the devil's game. I think we all know that faith seems to be in decline in the lives of many people. And I like to say that faith in God will lead us in one direction, and the lack of faith will lead us in another. And as more and more people are abandoning their faith, then it does seem that the devil uh, is kind of gaining a stronger foothold here in our country. That's really interesting. I, I th there's part of me that has always thought that um, there's sort of less, hmm, sorry, I'm not being very clear. That's really interesting. Uh, I've heard that there's a lot more demonic type of activity reported in third world settings and less in first world kind of Western contexts. Um, would, it, but you, you would say that that's increasing in the Western context right now or that we're interacting with it more actively. Yes, and I think the reason for that I like to say that there's a difference between exorcisms performed in the apostate world and in the, the pagan world, if you will. You mentioned third world countries, perhaps areas where the word of God has not been proclaimed or has really not taken root. You know, I've had the opportunity to travel to South Africa, for example, and exorcisms there, they're performed and it's one and done. But here in the United States, for example, when people are dealing with the demonic, most of the people, I think, in the United States have been exposed to somewhat, you know, some level of Christianity. You know, Christianity built Western civilization. And but because of that, there are many people that have turned their back on their relationship with Christ. Many people who have been baptized, for example, may have become lapsed in their faith. They may say they no longer believe in God, now claim to be an atheist. And it does seem that people who knew the truth of the gospel and then walked away from it, that the demonic has a greater hold on them because they basically said to God, get out. 
Now, I'm going to be the devil's advocate, probably quite <laughs> literally, in this one instance. So let's say that I'm really skeptical and I just don't buy that there really are demonic possessions in the world. Now, as an exorcist, what sort of tests do you have to go through to even filter out all these other things like psychological issues or people faking mm -hmm. it? What's what sort of uh, what is the sort of test that the church runs to make a positive case? I will say, first of all, when it comes to the reality of evil, it's biblical revelation and the magisterium, the teaching, the authority of the church that helps us understand exactly the reality of evil. As I mentioned earlier, there may be some people today who say that evil is something of our own making, humanity's inhumane treatment of one another. But when we read the biblical accounts, Jesus makes a clear distinction between people who were suffering from a physical illness and those who were demonically possessed. Even when he sends his disciples out, he gives them authority to heal, but he also gives them the authority to cast out unclean spirits. So Jesus himself makes the clear distinction between the two. Here in the United States, you know, as an exorcist, I need to reach moral certitude. I have to believe beyond a doubt that the person in front of me is truly dealing with the demonic. And I believe that the church would cause greater harm if she labels someone as being possessed and that label prevents the person from getting the true help that they need. So the protocol that I follow, as well as every other exorcist in the United States, is the person needs, first of all, to have a psychiatric evaluation. So the church wants experts in the mental health field to weigh in, basically asking the question, is there something about this person's condition that is outside of your understanding, your scope of knowledge or expertise? Step two of the protocol, would be to have a physical examination by their family doctor. Again, ruling out any type of physical cause for what they're experiencing. Step three of the protocol would be to uh, do an intake questionnaire. If it's truly something of a demonic nature, then to determine what was the entry point. What did the person do that gave the authority to the demon to enter into this person's life? Because knowing what the entry point was, then allows me and my role to close that door, if you will. Step number four, the church says that there are four signs that I can look for. Number one would be the ability to speak and understand languages otherwise unknown to the individual, having superhuman strength beyond the normal capacity of the individual, having elevated perception, meaning the person in front of me would not know certain things but if certain things are being revealed, that would indicate that it's a demonic presence and no longer the consciousness of this person as an individual. And then step four, the thing I would look for would be an aversion to anything of a sacred nature, such as having the Bible read in front of the person, the word of God, being in a sacred space, a church or a chapel, being blessed with holy water, being shown a crucifix, anything again of a sacred nature that would cause a violent reaction. Step five, I would say is the most important. It's to help normalize the spiritual life of the person or to bring the person to Jesus Christ for the very first time. You know, a lot of times people I deal with, they want the demonic to be gone, but the demonic being gone is actually the easy part. The person also has to invite God in. Think of the great example in Luke's gospel in chapter 11, where it talks about how the unclean spirit, once it's been cast out, it goes and wanders through the arid wasteland and coming back and finding the house swept clean. Swept clean meaning it's gone, but God hasn't been invited in. And then it goes and finds seven other demons worse than itself. And they come back and take up residence in the person. So again, I'm trained to be a skeptic. I have to exhaust every possible explanation about what's happening in the life of this person. So consulting the, the psychiatrist, the psychologist, having the family doctor weigh in. Now, I'm not asking them if they think a person is possessed. I will make that determination, but I need the best possible information that I can get. So these experts are asked to share uh, their knowledge to help me arrive at that moral certitude. Again, beyond a doubt, the person in front of me 
it's truly dealing with the demonic. Well, thank you. That was, it's helpful to see, um, this attempt to search for things that cannot be just psychologically explained, like knowledge that they shouldn't have or acts of strength that they shouldn't be capable of. Could we maybe go through some of those and just uh, give our audience some stories? Uh, could you give us an example of a, a time where you've encountered knowledge uh, being had by the person that they really shouldn't be able to have? Yes. And I think it would be important at least to take a moment and to say the reason that the demonic would be capable of these things is based on angelic nature. So when God created the angels, uh, they received into his knowledge. You know, we as humans, we go to school, we can learn over a period of time. But the angelic nature is such that when they were created, God gave them into his knowledge. It's like a computer being downloaded with information. So an, an angel doesn't have to go to school to learn how to speak Aramaic or Latin or Greek. It can just call it up. So if I know from my working with this individual that that person does not speak any of these ancient languages, that would be an indication that it's no longer them, but it is the demonic speaking through them. And when it comes to things of a, a sacred nature, we can say that the elements of our Christian faith, you know, the very things with the demons, which the demons have rejected, are literally thrown into their face. So the reading of scripture, in the rite of exorcism, I read from the Psalms. I read accounts from the, uh, the Gospels about Jesus expelling demons, basically saying to the demon, Christ has defeated you before, you will be defeated again. You need to accept the power and the authority of Jesus Christ. And I like to remind people that I don't have any special powers and abilities. If people are relying on me, we're all in trouble. But if we're relying on the power and the authority of Christ at work through the church and his ministers, that's the proper understanding to have. Even in an exorcism, Jesus is not a bystander. He is the main actor. So again, these signs of demonic activity, you know, I've witnessed all of them. The demonic can play on a person's memory and imagination. You know, I, there was an exorcism in Rome, for example, one of the 40 that I set in on, that when the demon manifested, you know, a, a possession means that the demon takes control of the person's body, treating that body as if it were its own, using the person's mouth to speak, their ears to hear, their arms and hands to give gestures, their feet and legs to move. And it's always important then once the demon manifests to realize that all the actions now of that physical body are wholly defined by the demon and no longer by that person. So if the person's name is John Doe, I wouldn't say that John Doe is exhibiting superhuman strength. I would say the demon is doing that, but using John Doe's body. So one of the exorcisms... So actually... Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. So you've actually had examples where, you know, little old ladies are able to, to do physical feats of strength that they really shouldn't be able to do? Like, Absolutely. And there might be I, some people I, I would say, her. there might be people say, well, that might be possible when people are just filled with adrenaline that they can do these things. But again, we're making the distinction between, is it really that person's consciousness? Is, are they truly present? or is there a evil spirit operating through them? So one of the exorcisms in Rome, when the demon manifested, this little elderly man, the body jumped out of the chair and then lifted the chair up with one hand over his head. And this was an old, heavy metal swivel desk. I mean, I could barely lift it up, but the demon had lifted it up with one hand over its head and then had this crazy hysterical laughter and grin and then threaten to throw it towards me. So I'm up here, the Father Carmine is praying the, the rite of exorcism, and I'm up literally doing a dance, trying to wrest this chair out of this demon's hands so that I don't get hit with it. Devil's advocate here, but aren't there instances where people manifest super strength in high stress situations? 
And there's also, you pointed out, other languages. Now, that actually is really interesting because how do you confirm that people just don't know Latin or Greek? What are some instances where this is manifested in individuals that clearly didn't know these languages? And that's why, you know, the Catholic Church says that there's no such thing as an emergency exorcism. You know, you work with somebody over a period of time and you may get to that. It's like when somebody's sick, you know, you have a headache. You don't tell your doctor, hey, I, I need to have brain surgery tomorrow. You know, that you go to see your doctor and they begin treating you. You may get to the point where you need that, but that's a progression over a period of time. So in working with people and getting to know them and the intake questionnaire, then I would know, well, obviously, that this person doesn't speak ancient Greek, for example. So there are things that I would know about them that they're not capable of doing. And the other thing is that it's also important, like superhuman strength and these other things, which consciousness is present? Is it the individual that I have come to know over the period of time? Or is it now an alien presence, if you will, that's operating through this person's body? So I really need to know who am I conversing with in front of me? And that's why the church, again, is very deliberate in its actions, you know, in knowing, is it the demon? Is it the person as an individual? And there are people that, again, maybe due to mental illness, they may, you know, act the same way that people would if they're possessed. But that's why the church always moves in a very methodical way. For example, you know, holy water the church uses. What's, what's the significance of holy water? It reminds us of our baptism into Christ by which we became a new creation. There's no, there's no special power or ability in holy water, but it points to something greater. And that something greater is our new life in Christ. So if somebody's coming to me, telling me that they're dealing with the demonic in their life, one of the things that I might do is I will bless them either with holy water or with tap water. Now, I will know if the water has been blessed or not. The demon will recognize the presence of the sacred but that person as an individual will not know. So if I were, for example, to bless them with tap water and there's a strong negative reaction, that might lead me to believe that this might be something more of a mental health issue rather than a spiritual issue related to the presence of a demon. That's, that's a brilliant sort of experiment to see if this person reacts or not, if it's a psychological thing or a supernatural. What I'm wondering is, um, if you know, and the demon can kind of tell, and demons are supposed to be these sort of manipulative, cruel entities, can't they start to just mess with you? Like, I'm going to pretend to react to this water to trick you into thinking it's psychological. Like, if, if these demons really do exist and really are what we think they are, are, are they playing games even with your process of discernment to just mess with you? And they can. Ab absolutely. They can do that. Because demons want to give the impression that they're in charge, they're in control. Demons would even say that they're infuriated, that they would even be interrogated by a human whom they consider to be inferior to themselves. And they reach the point where their hatred of the human person reaches such a high degree that they let their guard down, if you will, and they reveal their true character. So they may be trying to manipulate, give false impressions, but eventually their pride and their arrogance gets the best of them and they show their true hand, if you will. I love there's one part of an interview where it's mentioned that something like one in 5,000 cases or something mm -hmm. close to that, are actually ruled demonic. So that just, to me, shows the sort of rigor that the church goes through before it's willing to actually designate something a case of demonic possession. But coming off of that, something that occurs to me, and I've never heard an answer to, is a demon starts speaking in ancient Greek or Latin or these other languages. It starts manifesting supernatural strength. That seems to confirm what your suspicions are so that you can then root out the underlying problem. 
what is the mm-hmm. point of speaking in these languages? What is the point of manifesting these uh, super, superhuman strength? It seems yeah. to work why against the, the demon purses, purposes. Well, why are they playing their cards? Yeah. Sorry, Seth. Go ahead. Yeah, they play their cards because they are, uh, it's their arrogance again and their pride because they're being, as I mentioned just a moment ago, they're being questioned, interrogated by a human person that they consider to be less than themselves. And so by speaking in these languages, by showing superhuman strength, the demon is really saying, look at me and how great I am. Look at how smart I am. Look at what I'm capable of doing. Now, sometimes people ask the question, why would a demon be interested in possessing a human body? You know, if they're this great, they have this great intellect, if you will, What's so great about a human body? And the answer really is at the core of our Christian faith. What's the greatest thing that, that God has done for us is the incarnation. God took on human form in the person of Jesus Christ. Demons, because they wish to mimic God and resemble God in all aspects, believe in their own twisted sense that they take on human form by possessing a human body. And then once they possess the body, what do they do to it? It's tormented. And why? Because the human person has been created in the image and likeness of God. We reflect the divine image. And demons believe that by possessing human bodies and putting them through these theatrics, that they are demonstrating that they're capable of attacking God, if you will, indirectly. Again, if the human person has the image of God, then demons believe that by by possessing a human body, they are attacking God himself. Um, I don't want to overly sensationalize with my questions, but I I do have a sense that one of the things we find most interesting uh, about the demonic is that they might give an actual tangible, empirical sense of evidence that the spiritual and the supernatural are real. Um, And I, I, so I don't want to sensationalize, but I'd love to know are is there one or two things that have happened that just knocked any of your doubts out of the park? And you're like, nope, that requires the supernatural. I mean, you talked a bit about other languages and strength and those types of things. But has there been one or two stories that just sealed it for you? Like, this has to be real. This has to be demonic. This proves it. Materialism can't account for this. Do you have any examples like that? Yeah, I'll tell you... Um an exorcism that I did recently. So as an exorcist, I hear all kinds of very painful and horrific stories from people about how the demonic entered their life. This was a, a lady, she was 50 years old. She had grown up in Mexico and she had been away from the church for many years. She uh, arrived in Indianapolis. Her neighbor invited her to come back to church She said, well, I don't know. So the priest from the local parish went over to visit with them. And the priest said, he contacted me afterwards and said that he really felt like while he was there, there was a demonic presence in this woman. So then she agreed to come and speak with me. So myself, her, her friend came and this other priest were having a conversation. And the the lady shared with me that while growing up in Mexico, her father began to rape her at the age of seven, and it continued on over a five-year period. When she turned 12, her father turned his attention to her younger sister. She was fractured, she was broken. She said that at the time she blamed God for allowing this to happen, so she abandoned her relationship with God, and then she turned to the world of the occult. She turned to curanderos, witch doctors, brujas and witches, who told her that they could help put the pieces of her broken life back together. But she said everything that they did just left her even more broken than before. She's telling me the story. She is sobbing uncontrollably. And then she looks at me and says, will you help me? And I said, well, Jesus is the one who's going to help you. And soon as I said that, her eyeballs turned green. Her pupils became slanted like a serpent. And this voice comes out of her mouth and says, who's he? He has no power over us. 
Now, her friend sitting next to her literally jumped over the table to get away. This other priest that I was with fell to his knees and began praying uncontrollably. He was so terrified. And I got up and I walked over it. And this demon is looking at me with these green eyes, cussing me out again, blaspheming God. And I lay my hand on the person's head and I begin to pray. And then in, I reached in my pocket and took holy water and just blessed the person, again, reminding them of their baptism into Christ. The demon shrieked and collapsed and began whimpering and fell to the floor. Now, this was not the time to do the exorcism. As a priest, I prepare myself. I celebrate mass. I go to confession. I will spend time in prayer. I determine where the exorcism will take place. I always tell people that an exorcism never takes place in an abandoned house at midnight on a dead end street during a thunderstorm. That makes for a great Hollywood movie, perhaps. But the devil does not get to choose where he will be defeated. The church herself will make that determination. So uh, the following week, we are in a chapel in the city of Indianapolis. Uh, again, when I meet with somebody, it's me, the afflicted person. I require them to bring a family member or a friend, and then there could be other people in the room that are there to pray. So we're in the chapel. When I do an exorcism, I will have the person sit in a chair facing towards the altar, and then I begin the rite of exorcism. And the components of the rite are actually meant to force the demon to reveal itself because demons would prefer to remain hidden. But we can say that the rite of exorcism is dragging the demon into the light of Jesus Christ, kind of like a cockroach, if you will, that prefers the darkness and the cracks and the crevices. But the church drags the demon into the light of Christ the rite begins by blessing the person with holy water, again reminding us of our baptism into Christ. I will read one or more of the Psalms that speak of God's care, his love and mercy for his people. I will read gospel accounts of Jesus casting out demons. The prologue of John's gospel, the word became flesh, is very powerful in an exorcism. These things infuriate the demons so much that even though they want to kind of remain hidden, they're forced to lash out just like a, a wild dog, if you will. Part of the, uh, the ritual then is the insufflation prayer. So when I bless this person with holy water, there was the demon again. The eyes turned green, the slanted pupils. The demon looked at me and goes, you can't get rid of us. We've been here too long and you're not strong enough. And then began to laugh. But after reading from the, the Gospels, I did the insufflation prayer. It's the breathing on of the face of the person. It recalls when Jesus appeared in the upper room. He breathed on the face of his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. It's the recognition that wherever the Holy Spirit is present, evil spirits cannot remain. Fear is cast out. So I lightly breathed on the face of this person with the demon looking at me with these green eyes and lightly breathing, the chair actually f flew back 10 feet like it was hit by a strong wind. And then there was a shriek and a scream. The lady comes flying up out of the chair and collapses onto the floor. Myself and the other priests lift her up and she is literally glowing and glorifying and praising God. And one of the things that I've noticed in exorcisms to know that a demon has truly been cast out is that a person will radiate the glory of God because the demon is now gone. Many people might be familiar with pictures or paintings of saints that have a halo around their head. That halo is not their glory that they're radiating. They're radiating the glory of God. So much did they unite their lives, their free will with the will of God that they literally then will glow, if you will, the glory of God himself. So there's an example. And then whenever I work with somebody, I always put them under the pastoral care of their, of their priest or their minister. I will say that as an exorcist 
and I am because I am publicly known, I currently receive 3,500 emails and phone calls a year from people who believe they're dealing with the demonic here in the, from the United States, other parts of the world. They come, they're Catholics, they're Christians from other faith traditions, they come from other world religions or no faith background whatsoever. So there's all kinds of people who uh, are turning to the church who believe that they're dealing with the demonic. And then my role would be to investigate these situations or to network them with somebody in their local area who will be able to provide them with the care and the uh, help that they need. Now, I know you say it doesn't happen in a barn during a thunderstorm. That's a very much a movie trope. But then you go on to describe something that could easily be a scene from a Hollywood horror film. So it has yes. to, I have to ask, what are the tropes from movies that you've seen that are accurate? Or I'm assuming you've seen some movies with exorcisms in them. Or, Absolutely. And what are some... Okay, great. Yeah. So what are some tropes that are accurate and what are some tropes for movies that are wholly inaccurate? And what are just some misperceptions about this that people may carry with them? Again, I think it's important for people to realize that all these theatrics of the, the devil and his demons are meant for trying to get people to focus on what the devil is doing rather than focusing on what God wants to do in this particular prayer of the church. In an exorcism, the real focus is on the power and the authority of Jesus Christ. But demons, because of their arrogance and pride, are, are saying, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at what I'm capable of doing. When I was training in Rome, uh, a demon caused the person's body to levitate. So I'm looking at this person across from me, the exorcism is being performed, the demon gets this hideous grin on its face and then begins to rise up out of the chair. And I'm looking at this kind of in disbelief, but the priest training me kind of, he's praying and he has the ritual in his hand and then he's glancing, you know, he looks over and sees the, uh, the levitation occurring. He glances back at his book, he continues to pray. He looks back over at what the demon is doing he looks back at his book. He continues to pray. And then at one moment, he just takes his hand, puts it on the head of the person, and pushes the body back into the chair. He did not even flinch or even stop in his prayer to God, asking God to help this person and free them from this demonic influence. So again, the demon was basically saying, look at me, look at me. But the actions of the priest were, no, 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 look at God, look at God. But all of these tropes that you mentioned, you know, whether it's, it's levitation, foaming at the mouth, eyes rolled in the back of the head. You know, I've seen demons, uncontrollable laughter, hysteria. Demons manifest, the person's body will drop to the ground and begin slithering like a snake on the floor. Again, all of these things are the demonic saying, look at me and what I'm capable of doing. But because the devil can play on a person's memory, on their imagination, in the 17 years that I've done this, I don't really pay attention anymore to any of these things. They don't really impress me. There's, there's a, uh, a saint in the Catholic Church, Padre Pio, Franciscan priest from Italy. He died in 1968, was canonized a saint uh, right around the year 2000. And uh, he used to deal with demonic attacks in his life. It wasn't that he did anything wrong, because when it comes to demonic activity, the church identifies four types. Infestation, the presence of evil in a location or associated with an object. Vexation, physical attacks by a demon. Obsession, mental attacks by a demon. Possession, which is what we've been talking about. A demon taking control of a person's body, treating that body as if it were its own. But there is something called demonic oppression. And oppression is a gift from God. God allows somebody to be tormented by the devil as an opportunity for that person in the midst of their suffering to show their fidelity to God and as a result to grow in holiness and virtue. Think of Job out of the Old Testament. God permitted Satan to afflict him even though he did nothing wrong to invite the demon in. St. Paul speaks of the thorn in his flesh 
the messenger from Satan that was sent to torment him to keep him from becoming proud. Padre Pio, again, he would have many people come uh, to see him seeking spiritual counsel and advice and guidance. And uh, he said that the devil literally would attack him every day. Padre Pio reached the point where he would refer to the devil as old Bluebeard. So in his biography, he writes that one night when he was sleeping, he heard some noise in his room. He woke up and looked over in the corner and it was the devil. And he said, oh, it's only you, old Bluebeard. I thought it was somebody important. And then he rolled over and went back to sleep. So again, all of these theatrics are of the devil and his demons are, look at what I'm capable of doing. Look at my power. Look at my ability. But again, for people of faith, the focus is never on the demonic. It's always on the power and the authority of Christ. I love that image of someone levitating and the priest just sort of casually lowering them back down and continuing to pray. Um, what I, I feel like from the outside, we're also unused to this, that we imagine that it must just be this terrifying, intense, insane sort of situation where your adrenaline's just constantly up. But actually, I mean, these things can last hours and hours, if not days. Does it get to a point where someone's casting a demon out of someone and you're in the corner of the room almost daydreaming or <laughs> on your phone or, you know, you sneak out for a second to get a bag of Doritos or you're catching up on an episode of Rings of Power in the room next to it? Because, you know, the, it, like what are give us some of those realistic moments of, of just the things you wouldn't think are happening. But, you know, this is your job. This is, and I, You're right. I, I'd love some of that. Yeah. It can become so commonplace. I will say that one of the things I remember the priest that trained me again, Father Carmine, in the midst of an exorcism one time, the phone is ringing in the other room. He just immediately stops praying, walks out and answers the phone. And I hear him in there, like, you know, in Italian, scheduling another appointment with somebody. And then the person that's now possessed the demon is manifesting in front of me the all the theatrics are going on and i'm looking at this and he's in the, he's in the other room on the phone scheduling another appointment and then he just walks right back in and picks up where he left off so there is that danger that it can become too routine or too commonplace that one isn't really present in the moment you know as an exorcist i'm also the pastor of two parishes here in the state of indiana and I've done exorcisms on a Saturday morning. An hour later, I'm celebrating a wedding. And then later on that evening, I could have a weekend service. So it's literally moving from one thing to the next. So you have to be well-balanced and to know which hat you're wearing in doing these different components of priestly ministry. Even with that said, I, I will add this on. Being the exorcist, I believe, has helped me to rediscover priesthood as a, as a vocation. I think all pastors today, all church ministers can reach the point because we seem to be so overwhelmed that we view what we do as a job and not a vocation. And I believe the word vocation means a calling from God. We do what we do because God has called us to do it. But since I've been the exorcist, it's helped me to rediscover priesthood as a vocation and not an occupation. And as a vocation, then we can truly be present to the people that we're ministering to and, you know, not off in the corner daydreaming, yawning or whatnot, but really being present and bringing Christ to these people, no matter what it's, if what we're doing, whether it's the exorcism, whether it's doing a service on Sunday, whether it's performing a wedding. Again, to be present in that moment, reflecting the image of Christ to others. That's a beautiful way to put that. But for the people there who might still feel a little bit of <laughs> angst after hearing all these stories, you know, you have on the one hand, someone like Padre Pio, uh, Pio someone like Padre Pio, who took the sense of the 
demonic in a very sort of lighthearted, jokey manner. Oh, it's just you, old Bluebeard. That was Padre Pio, right? Yes. Okay, I had that right. But then on the other hand, there's a sense of of severity to this in the sense of don't mess around with witchcraft. So mm -hmm. in what sense do we wrestle with like avoiding certain activities and on the other sense not taking it so seriously that we can't have a lighthearted humor or mocking attitude towards the demonic? Some exorcists are uh, publicly known. Some choose to remain anonymous. The reason I'm publicly known is I like to speak on the topic to help educate people because I believe that once we know more about the reality of the devil, who he is, what he's capable of, what he's not capable of, then we come to discover that the devil really is nothing to fear. So to me, speaking on exorcism is a form of evangelization because the more that we know our faith, it will cast out fear. Scripture tells us that, you know, perfect love will cast out fear. So the more we are united to Christ, and we don't have to do anything extraordinary to defeat the devil. It's really living out our faith. You know, First Peter tells us, be sober, be vigilant. Your opponent, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone whom he may devour. Resist him solid in your faith. So if we are solid in our faith, we don't have anything to worry about from the demonic. And we can be solid in our faith as Christians. You know, we go to church, we pray, we read the word of God. It's these ordinary aspects that will keep the devil at bay. But I think there's a lot of people today that have just become bored with their faith in God. They're looking for something that seems to be more exciting. And unfortunately, when people are looking for that, the devil will take advantage of that and try to lure people into his traps. St. Paul in 2 Corinthians, Satan transforms himself into an angel of light and he deceives many people. So there are a lot of people today who are being deceived by the demonic. And I think the ministry of exorcism is one of the ways that we refute that deception and we bring people the divine truth, the truth of God, because that truth will always defeat the devil. Now we're running right up on the end of this interview, but a couple questions that I have to ask before I let you go. Number one, there is a debate within at least Protestant circles on whether or not a Christian, a baptized Christian can become possessed or whether or not they can only suffer from that oppression that you mentioned with Job. And number mm -hmm. two, how would you relate demonic activity to other things such as ghosts or ufos or creatures in the woods to what extent can we blame all paranormal phenomenon <laughs> on the demonic so the first question is you know is it possible for a baptized christian to be possessed and my response would be if one is living out the commitment of what it means to be baptized absolutely they have nothing to fear but there are a lot of christians in this here in the United States who've been baptized, you know, we might use the term they have, you know, backslided from their faith. And again, if we walk away from the truth once we've known it, and walking away from the faith is basically saying to God, get out. You know, God respects our free will. The only thing that God does not have from us is our free will. And the goal of the Christian life, I would suggest, is to unite our will with the will of God. So even when God created the angelic world and then basically says, with this knowledge that I've given you, this infused knowledge, will you now choose to honor and glorify me? And then the belief is that, you know, Satan and one third of the angels, the book of Revelation talks about how his tail swept one third of the stars out of the sky. The church would see that as the fall of one third of the angelic choir, who now refer to Satan as their chief. And then the goal of the, the demonic would be to get humans to embrace his rejection of God. But again, if somebody is baptized, they're living out their faith, they have nothing to fear. But just because somebody has been baptized doesn't mean that they don't just walk away from that faith. And when they walk away, God will respect that choice. But then people can put them up, 
put themselves up against the forces and the attacks of the evil one. So I do think it's possible for a baptized Christian who has backslided in their faith that would experience some type of demonic attacks in their life. And then when it comes to other things, you know, can everything that we can understand be attributed to the demonic? You know, like ghosts and whatnot. You know, I would say you look at the fascination with ghost hunting today. Again, Halloween coming up. A lot of people are going on these tours of the abandoned, you know, mental hospital or prison. It isn't that demons live in these locations. You know, one of the saints, St. Saint Thomas Aquinas, would say that demons as pure spirits, they don't occupy space, they contain the space. It can be kind of heady to think about, but again, if we're in a room, that room's containing us. But a being that does not have a body, but is pure intellect and will, would contain the space. So it isn't that the demons are in the old prison, it's the very things that people are doing that are causing the demons to manifest there. And sometimes these demons will even give the impression that they're spirits of those who have died just as a way to lure people in. You know, the fascination with the world of the occult. People go to seances, go see a psychic or a median. You know, people need to be aware of the, where, the word of God. The book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament speaks about not practicing these things because they are a violation against the first commandment, where God says, I am the Lord your God, you shall not have strange gods before me. When people get involved in the world of the occult, then they're looking for a substitute for God in their life. And whenever we look for a substitute for God, we turn our back on God, we can be inviting the demonic in. And the demonic can try to play on our minds in many ways. So again, it is possible that you know when people are making references to aliens and UFOs. The demonic is playing on our imaginations just as a way to confuse all of us. The devil loves chaos. He loves chaos. And I always say that when it comes to the ordinary activity of the devil, it begins with deception. He wants us to buy into his lies. Once we buy into the deception, it leads to division. We find ourselves broken. Once we find ourselves broken, it leads to diversion. We begin to look for a substitute for God. The devil is certainly willing to take that place. And after diversion, it leads to discouragement. People begin to lack any meaning, purpose, and direction in their lives. I personally believe that there are more people discouraged today than there are people who are depressed. The great line from St. Augustine, you have created us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. The human person has the innate desire for God. The devil wants to short circuit that desire, if you will. Again, he does that by the deception, which leads to division, which leads to diversion, which leads to discouragement. And once we arrive at discouragement, we have a choice to make. One pathway leads to death, sometimes physical. Look at the rise in suicides in our country, sometimes spiritual. Look at the number of people who have been baptized who've now completely rejected Christ in their lives. But as Christians, we are a people of hope. Even when things seem bleak, we know that God is still in control. The other pathway leads to discipleship. People can have a reawakening of the importance of faith in God in their lives, and they recommit to him. Well, one last question for you to end things. Uh, I think it's C.S. Lewis who said, the more interested you get in demons, the more interested they get in you. Um, and that we sort of open ourselves up a little bit to the demonic merely by, by thinking about it. Um, and what I'm wondering is, have you felt since you took on this role in the church uh, more of a demonic presence attacking you? And, I mean, are we opening ourselves up as hosts by having this conversation and our listeners by listening to it? I think the, the question will be, what will people do with this conversation? Will it lead to a fascination with what the, de the devil is capable of doing? Or will it lead to a 
renewed fascination with God, whereby we look at God and say, wow, look at what God is capable of doing. And again, if it leads to a greater fascination with God, then it's achieved its, its purpose. And you're right what C.S. Lewis said, the more we pay attention to the demonic, the more the demonic pays attention to us. That's the danger again of Halloween, which seems to glorify evil. But again, speaking about the devil kind of in a theological way, like we're doing today, I believe, that's really not glorifying the devil. It's really debunking him. Again, it's dragging him out into the light of Christ where he will be destroyed. Thank you so much, Father Lampert. Any final words before we head out? I would just say that, again, to re reiterate the fact that the more that we know about the devil, the more we come to realize that he has nothing to fear. You know, early on in the ministry, you know, I was taken aback by some of the things that I've witnessed. But anymore, the focus for me is always on what God wants to do in people's lives. And we have to realize that the human person, again, has been created in the image and likeness of God. We have great value. We have great dignity. And the thing that we can do is simply to uh, love God in return. He loves us. We love God in return. We embrace God's love. I, I love uh, the prophet Habakkuk. I'll leave you with this thought. One of the minor prophets in the, in the Old Testament, Habakkuk. It's a name in Hebrew, which means he who embraces. And what did he embrace? He embraced God. If all of us become people who embrace God, then the devil really has no place to take root in our lives. So the more that we know God, the more we come to realize the devil is nothing to fear. Thanks again for listening to the Spiritually Incorrect Podcast. If you like what you heard, please consider subscribing and leaving us a five-star review. We're an up-and-coming podcast, and every little bit helps. Also consider joining our Patreon page. Patreon sponsors have exclusive access to unaired episodes, different kinds of merchandise, the ability to suggest an episode, and even an hour-long interview with Jonathan and I. Check it out at spirituallyincorrectpodcast.com and see what you're missing out on. Sound effects from zapsplat.com. Special thanks to Jordan Birch, whose song Starry Night provides the intro and outro for this podcast. You can hear more of his music on YouTube or Spotify.